Okay, I'll start the meeting at eight o'clock and take roll call. Hernandez. Uh, Sergio, I think you're muted. Yeah. Here. Lindsay Ryan. Here. Mendoza. Here. Halpern. Here. Partha. Here. Hem. Here. Tanya Booty. Here. Thank you, Adila. All right, so right off the bat, um, on our agenda, we have uh, board and superintendent comments. Um, Dr. Horton. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, just wanted to say um, this is uh, just a really, uh, I guess I would say exciting time for me, but really challenging for me and, and our team as well. Um, being in a, the first board meeting as superintendent, I never imagined that we would be uh, planning and unveiling a um, a pandemic return to school plan. Uh, but our team has, they've had our back. The community has been really strong. Our, our board has been extremely supportive with great feedback. Um, and we are, um, I would say the excitement part is to be able to get this out publicly so that we can um, get feedback again uh, from constituents who have not heard. Uh, but again, this team that, uh, that I've inherited, they've been nothing short of remarkable um, with, with really putting all of their time in vacation still working, uh, it, it's amazing. And so uh, just know that today, uh, is, a, is a, while it's a pandemic unveiling, it is also a, a just a positive outlook for how the, what's to come in our district with our future and how strong we will be. So I, I'm thankful for, for each and every one of you uh, and knowing that our community, our union leaders, our union members, our staff, uh, we hear you, community partners, we hear you. Uh, and we will continue to work together uh, to fight uh, this pandemic and don't allow it, and don't allow it to detour our plan to close this achievement gap and make it right for all students. So I just wanted to say that short statement. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a brief statement. Um, It cannot be said often enough that we are living in unprecedented times. In the absence of national leadership to properly address and prepare to prevent or combat a, a global pandemic that the responsibility uh, is falling on the shoulders of local arms of government. And at that moment, that includes us, the institution of schooling. Because of the situation before us, we are being asked to make plans with no perfect options to choose from. Further, our community is, is rich in its wealth of racial, ethnic, ethnic, religious, LGBTQ identity, economic, and economic diversity. And despite our diverse background, our schools are indeed a common good belonging to all of us. That means though that we have families who are living in the economic margins as the global economic economy slows, working impossibly hard to ensure enough income to keep food on the table, as well as housing overhead, who need a safe place for their for their children that can be a deliberate, where their children can get, get deliberate attention to their learning needs and progress. While we also have households with income flex, flexibility and schedules that allow for adult participation in remote learning and social emotional wellness. We want nothing more, who want nothing more, excuse me, than to continue to shelter in place. We have stakeholders with a wide range of needs and perspectives, and it's important that we take all of these perspectives to heart and be and into consideration as we make plans for the future. And unfortunately, the falling on our shoulders as a local governing body 
to make plans, thoughtful plans to respond to the global pandemic of both racism and COVID-19. Um, and yeah, we have a, an exciting and difficult conversation before us, but I wanted to remind us that we are have, some of us are having very different experiences of COVID-19. Were there any other comments from the board? Ben? I want to start by thanking Dr. Horton, who's given endless hours to our district before his position ever officially began. Um, I'm beyond grateful for your thoughtful engagement of so many stakeholders to ensure that we're considering all the possible options for our return to school. Um, as we discuss plans today, I want to honor that there are no solutions without obstacles and costs and thank the many folks on our administrative team and principals who have worked so hard to find the best options possible in an unprecedented situation. Um, while we have to acknowledge that we are in an unprecedented and seemingly impossible time, we must not be paralyzed from acting in ways that reduce the harm as much as we can. Uh, we must prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable. And for many in our community, there are scenarios that will result in children not learning and families not eating. While some families are able to create stopgap solutions and workarounds for an indefinite period of remote learning, other families just don't have those options for tutors, not leaving the house for work, creating learning pods, et cetera. And so we must provide options for our most marginalized students. I hope you join me in believing that we can't pick a return to school option that will result in greater harm and costs for some families over others. Equity and justice make it impossible for us to eliminate the option of in-person schooling for some. Um, many members of our community are, have been brainstorming all the possible ways we can navigate this next phase. And many of us have the economic flexibility that allows us to be successful in all of the possible scenarios. But each family will need to evaluate how to meet their needs with the options available. And I urge all of us to respect the agency and decision-making of others and understand that every family has its own math to consider to make the best decision for their family. Our educators have already proven they are capable of rising to the challenge the pandemic has provided. Their dedication and creativity helped us navigate a complicated spring and plan for an uncertain future. And we are grateful that our educators will utilize all their gifts to provide solid academic options for all students. Um, as a person who plans their life month and months in advance, I share your discomfort with the uncertainty and appreciate your patience. Um, we have incredible resources and creativity in our community and collectively and jam, and here, ahead and ensure our most vulnerable students and families are we're almost we're out of jam almost thank you time to leave can thank you thank you biz any other comments from the board Samuel? Had, yeah thank you for uh building some time. Um, so just wanted to, again, thank Dr. Horton, as well as uh, the cabinet and all the community members who were part of the task force. I had the uh, fortunate pleasure of being part of this process uh, and the compression planning that, that it took to um, get together over almost about 60 people uh, who represented parents and community groups and uh, you know staff uh, from all the uh, bar bargaining units. Uh, it was a, a really incredible experience. And the hope is that we continue to engage, given that this is, you know, the pandemic is is uh, is forcing us to rethink things as, as we uh, as we create them. So um, again, very honored to have been part of that process. And again, thank you to all the folks who involved in in, in uh, facilitating, uh, as well as leading these discussions. Um, and 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 just very thankful for, for for the process. And again, a process that I'm sure will continue um, uh, as we continue to get information from the community to uh, help us you know, reshape how we transform education in a way that uh, meets the needs of all students across Evanston uh, and Skokie. Uh, I'll do this in Spanish too. Le dar gracias al, 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 al gabinete y a nuestro superintendente, el Dr. Orton, uh, por haber sido parte de este proceso de crear un plan para el regreso de escuelas. Y quiero invitar a la comunidad que siga este, Siguiendo lo que está el trabajo que estamos haciendo aquí como una cámara directiva de, de esta escuela y este fui, el, el proceso fue un proceso buenísimo que este donde tuvimos varios este participantes de diferentes niveles en nuestra en nuestra comunidad este fue, teníamos este padres 
este, maestros, teníamos de todo, todo, todo tipo de representantes de la comunidad en este proceso y esperamos que sigan este, participando en este proceso porque vamos a tener que cambiar cosas este, ya, ya que empecemos las escuelas. Entonces, este, esperemos que, que todos sigan este, um, participando en este proceso. Gracias. And welcome to all. We, we, I want to welcome all community members. We have over 500 participants, so welcome to all of you to, 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 the, to this uh, to board meeting, special board meeting. Thank you. All right, so uh, Sergio, actually, you have the next um, motion. Sure, sir. I move that the Board of Education approve the personnel appointments as presented. Second. Hernandez? Yes. Lindsay Ryan? Yes. Mendoza? No. Gilpern? Yes. Cartha? Yes. Kim? Yes. Tanya Budi? Yes. And with with that vote, uh, Dr. Horton, would you like to introduce uh, the personnel? Yes, uh, I guess I would. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by saying we have, um, as a district, there is there is work. We have found some great candidates uh, to come into our district, but there's work that we have to do internally around continuing to build the capacity of our current leadership and our staff. Uh, so when opportunities come a year from now, that we will be able to find candidates internally that represent our student population, continue to uh, look for diverse candidates. Uh, that is an effort that is being led by HR, and we will be sure um, that we are addressing that moving forward. Um, it, is, it is a process, uh, and this is our first round of, of hiring. So I want to start out by introducing the first, our assistant superintendent, who happens to be on the call. Um, He's an experienced leader coming out of, he worked at Gary Public Schools as well as CPS, uh, serving at cabinet level, served as a principal, uh, and has a lot of recognition across the country for doing great work. And that is the new assistant superintendent for middle schools. That was Terrence Little. You're on mute, sir. As we enter into the, the world of Zoom, how's everybody doing this morning? Excellent, welcome. Oh, everybody's on Zoom. It's a whole different feel. But, uh, <laughs> but like I say, it's a pleasure to come out here and do this work. It's a pleasure to be here, you know, as we race to be the leaders of the whole nation. Like I tell people right now, there's not a book out here that you can find about how to do this work right now during this pandemic. And it's just a pleasure right now to be working with some great minds as we not only solve this academic problem, I mean, this pandemic problem, but as we solve this racial equity problem. So it's just a pleasure and a joy to do this work because I see people, everybody smiling. So it's like, I'm finally in a district where everybody's enjoying doing this. And I'm looking at all the smiling faces right now. So it's like, hey, I am in it. And I'm just proud to be here. And one thing I am is a continuous learner. So if you ever see me somewhere, you want to tell me something, you want to shoot me an email, I just say, I'll give everybody my number. Um, always reach out to me, let me know, because I'm continuously trying to learn, trying to get better. And it, I'm hoping that we're all doing the same thing. So once again, it's always for the students, it's always for our kids, and it's just a pleasure to be here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going back to mute. <laughs> all right. Good. All right. Um, the next position uh, that we searched uh, to actually find um, a leader who's going to help move our equity work. Well, we're all responsible for this across the district. Uh, as our board, when they brought me in, said that we all are equity leaders, but we have a manager of equity who's also going to support our face work. Um, this is an individual who was responsible for training a lot of the many of the equity leaders in the Evanston and Skokie community. Um, and that individual is Devon Alexander. Uh, we're excited to bring him on board. Um, he's a um, he's an ally and, a, and a, actually a good friend of Robin D'Angelo. So they do work 
um, together, and we're excited to be able to bring him on board. Um, he's not on the call today, but you will soon get a chance to meet Devon Alexander. And then finally, we, uh, we actually are we're in the process of getting a new student information system, and we know uh, the board has challenged our team and said what's really important for us is that we, we focus on uh, right size fitting our district, um, getting um, schools in the right place, programming in the right place. So we went, we went local and we found a very talented leader who's, who's passionate, who knows the ins and outs of Evans and Skokie School of this district and these communities. That's gonna be a great um, ally and a great leader for us. And that is Sarita Smith. She'll be coming in as the manager of student assignment. And those two positions, manager of, of equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as the manager of student assignment, will be reporting to um, our deputy superintendent, Dr. Green. Uh, again, we are excited about bringing them on board, but this is, again, my commitment will be, we will work our staff that we currently have to build capacity. Uh, and as we open up opportunities across our school district, we will be sure that we continue to start to target uh, Latinx, African-American leaders and African-American leaders that look like our students uh, that's talented and we've supported them. So please uh, welcome them all and we're looking forward to what they're gonna bring to our great district. Thank you and welcome. All right, Does you have the next motion. Yep, I move that the Board of Education approve the June 2020 board meeting minutes. Second. Second. Hernandez? Yes. Lindsay Ryan? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Kilpern? Yes. Kartha? Yes. Kim? Yes. Tanya Woody? Yes. And Rebecca, you have the next motion. Uh, yes, uh, I move that the Board of Education approve the Doorway to Learning Child Care Reopening Plan. Second. Second. Hernandez? Yes. Lindsay Ryan? Yes. Are, are we going to, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Are we going to have an opportunity to take a look at, is there a presentation on this or we're just voting on it? Uh, Dr. Horton, did anybody from your team have, or did you want to share a little bit about the doorway to learning plan? Right. Or is it encompassed in the next presentation in the discussion? We do have discussions about, uh, not necessarily specifically about that programming, but our, our plans are return. But Romy, is there anything that you would like to add about this? Yeah, the, the plan is actually attached in the agenda, but uh, my understanding is that this wouldn't necessarily approve the official reopening, but would just allow us to apply for the license. So if and when the school board deems it safe to return, that we would be able to do so. This is actually giving us the authority to move forward with applying for the license. So when we're ready to reopen, we can. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for the question, Sunny. Okay. Um, so, Hernandez? Lindsay Ryan? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Kelpern? Yes. Kartha? Yes. Kim? Yes. Tanya Woody? Yes. So that motion passed seven zero. Um, the next item on our agenda is public comment. Um, due to the governor, due to governor's orders, the District sixty five Board of Education is conducting a virtual board meeting and adjusting the method of public comment as allowed by the public access counselor during the current state of emergency. Members of the public wishing to provide a comment to be read at this special board meeting were asked to email the board secretary by 6 a.m. today. Okay, we did receive um, several comments and questions. Um, I will begin with 
a comment from Sarah Hollick. Uh, dear school board members and community members, I know many 65 families whose parents, guardians, both have to work out of necessity, including our own. The two incomes are necessary in order to continue living in Evanston, pay taxes, bills, and take care of loved ones. In addition, not all parents, guardians whose children attend D65 schools have the option to be able to work from home. I also know there is no one size fits all solution out there. I do, however, believe that a 100% remote learning plan is going to contribute to an exasperate our already present educational inequity. Families who are able to pot up and provide enrichment or supplemental support for their children will carry on while those who do not have the means to pay for tutors, teachers, or have the flexibility, schedule, job type, or actual physical space to supervise other children in a pod, let alone their own, will be left to figure out for themselves. And for the district that prides itself on its commitment to equity, this 100% remote plan would be a slap in the face to those who have worked so hard to improve said equity. A 100% remote plan is irresponsible and detrimental to the physical, mental, emotional, and academic growth our children need and receive by being in school with peers and teachers. You cannot ignore the fact that many of our brown, black, low SES language learners and diverse learner families in this district will irrevocably be harmed. While the privileged, non-disabled, English-speaking white children will continue to get ahead, the goal of public education is to help care for and educate our babies while we are out there contributing to society. While I understand that those who are able to step up to fill the holes our local, state, and federal government have left gaps seeing, it is our responsibility as citizens in this democracy to demand our government and institutions to do their jobs. Please reconsider a 100% remote plan. There are a lot of highly intelligent people out there working on back to school plans and some great hybrid models have been released by other nearby districts that include childcare in addition to regularly scheduled in-person instruction. I know it is hard and I know that everyone will be pleased with whatever end result you decide. Uh, well, not everyone will be pleased with whatever end result you decide. The parents who have the means, schedule, and mental fortitude to pot up or personally be there to support their own children, great. Do it. Please stay home. Use the resources the district is able to provide and do your part in helping keep everyone safe by keeping your children at home. But for most vulnerable students and those that have no other option, please rethink your 100% remote learning plan. That was a comment from Sarah Hollick. Um, we have several questions that were submitted by uh, community members. Leslie Helkham questions. If there are staggered schedules or partial impersonal person school days, will families with multiple children in different grades have the option of having both or all kids attend in person on the same days or concurrent time? A question from Elizabeth Myers. If parents will be given the option to do all remote learning, if we are not comfortable with our kids returning to school? Katie Thomas submits a question. Given that our community is currently experiencing low virus prevalence and September is a time when classes can be held outdoors, why has the decision been made to forego this limited opportunity and delay a possible in-person return to school at the end of September? when outdoor learning is less possible and we have we may be experiencing a second wave of infection. Joyce Hyman questions, wondering if outdoor learning schooling is being considered, weather permitting. Susanna Schmidt submitted a comment, while the educators did a tremendous job converting to online instruction, the learning stopped when the online segment was done, resulting frequently in no more than an hour of actual learning in a day. With that in mind, to the, con to the extent learning is done remotely, what steps have been taken to improve the quantity and quality of instruction? What is the teacher's union requiring in order for in-school learning to take place on a full-time basis? What steps have been and are being taken to address those concerns? How can parents help achieve these goals? What funding or financing is needed? A Haven mom submitted a comment. Assuming the school year begins with some form of learning from home, 
I'd like for there to be an option for assignments to be done with old fashioned pencil and paper. I am the only parent in my children's home. I do not have the option for working from home. I will be away from home most of the day. Some of the issues I had attempting to support my children this spring were my kids telling me they completed an assignment and not being able to tell whether or not they had. My kids completing assignments and not being able to see how well or poorly they did. My kids being on the iPad for hours, 12 to 16 hours every day and not knowing if they are actually doing school work or playing. I am in no way a tech person. I had a very difficult time monitoring the assignments and keeping track of what my kids were supposed to be doing. Having the option of completing assignments on paper will allow me to better work with my kids and hopefully focus on the curriculum rather than trying to navigate the technology. For me, even if this means being emailed or going to some portal to print the assignments would help. I understand that this situation is not easy for everyone. A comment submitted by Evelyn S. Aslan Key, what will be expected in regards to completing schoolwork with our children? Who is too young to independently manage e-learning? Last year's e-learning just did not work for us at all. In fact, the only skill she seemed to gain was the ability to mess with the iPad. What changes have been made? Specifically, how are the youngest learners, those who are not independent, going to be engaged effectively? If we do not believe that e-learning has been sufficient in meeting our children's learning needs, what resource do we have? For example, are we able to hold them back next year? If we do, have accommodations been made to keep my child in any special programs like TUI? What changes have been made to integrate specials and classroom work onto one platform? Is the district going to see is the district going to release all the survey parent staff teacher results? And is the district going to release any metrics regarding how effective e-learning has been throughout the year? This has not been a transparent process. Is the district willing to acknowledge that this decision is likely to have long range negative consequences and to adjust quickly to correct for these? Specifically, what are the plans, metrics, measures for when we can get our children back to class? Or is this the permanent solution for the next few years with nothing else being considered? When children do go back to class, what are the plans for catching kids up? Is there a reopening planning committee working on ensuring that schools open next year or are we going to be in the same boat again then? If a parent chooses to unenroll their child for this year as e-learning is simply not a good fit for them, can they come back next year at their same grade, same program? Have plans been made to get non-digital classroom materials to children? What is the plan to address particular shortcomings to e-learning? What steps are being taken to ensure that children have some relationship with their teachers, particularly younger children? Will they be able to meet them? How is the district going to address children who fall behind? How will this be monitored in a setting where the teacher never actually meets the child and has no ability to directly observe their performance? How will the district get the full curriculum for each grade to parents? How is the district going to support parents during the situation financially, emotionally, or coaching for parents who are struggling? How will TWE be adapted to be effective at home? Which committee people are working on that? How will parents be instructed to the, in the appropriate ways to address the needs of children who are supposed to be in two-way immersion? As the city seems completely comfortable offering summer camps and programs, but now the board is unwilling to even try to open schools for families with real need, what childcare options is the city providing? I do not feel like the district has been transparent in this process. In addition, they have not at all considered the damage that they have chosen to do to working families. So my final questions are, how in the world is D65 ever going to utter the word equity with a straight face again? And how in the world will they ever be able to rebuild trust with those of us who are not independently wealthy enough to have the nanny do the homeschooling? Next, we have a question from Dana Darty. I'm concerned about student learning. Will the online curriculum have more synchronous lessons than the end of last school year? We have a comment from Ted Anderson. Since temperature screens have taken us against asymptomatic COVID-19, will teachers and all employees in contact with kids and kids areas be tested? What test will be used? How often? Where will the testing physically happen? And what are the procedures if a teacher or employee misses a scheduled test? 
Will children have access to free testing? What specific procedures will be put in place to promote physical distancing? What will happen if kids don't follow the rules? Better management for remote learning communication. Can there be better contact email management where parents are not inundated with multiple emails? Will remote learning have a routine and focus and not be a free-for-all where parents get bombarded at all hours from multiple teachers and D65 entities? As the primary caregivers now turned homeschooling teachers, parents expect support that is helpful. We don't wanna be assigned homework by the teachers. So who, so who is in charge of managing the number of emails one household will receive? We have a comment from Taylor Kehi. What are the metrics for returning to school? Is Evanston planning to use similar metrics? As a, as a city, we've maintained very low numbers across the board. As a working parent that doesn't have the luxury of working from home or hiring private tutors, I would like to know if we are planning to return to school while the numbers are down and closing if they go past a certain threshold. Is there a plan to return to school mid-year if the numbers drop back down to an acceptable level? What is the plan? Also, is there a plan to get worksheets and other physical materials to students during the times that schools are closed? Are there other specific hurdles in returning to school beyond the science and numbers? Are the teachers willing to return and teach while numbers are low? Are there financial worries? Michael Davis submitted a comment. Um, will the board regulate higher standards to provide all students with the same level of virtual teaching across D65? We are looking for weekly class sessions with the social worker and other specialized teacher, daily meetings with classroom teachers and daily live lessons. In particular, will Lincoln Elementary School have at least one meeting a day between the teacher and students, preferably two? A critical element of school for my children, grades two and five, is the class community and their relationship with their teacher. Thank you and all the board for your leadership and contributions in the service of public education in Evanston. Carrie Mackett submitted a comment. The District 65 Return to School Task Force was comprised of many educational and civic leaders, but no physician, scientists, students, or independent parents without a conflict of interest in the school system. This was remiss and should be expanded going forward so that medical data is fully incorporated and voices from all stakeholders are heard. Please use the local Evanston data when making decisions now and throughout the year. Our numbers have been very low for almost two months. Our rolling seven day new case count is 2.4 per day and we have zero cases today. Many published scientific studies show that children have low rates of infection with COVID, most likely have only mild illness and are less likely to spread COVID than adults. There are risks with reopening schools, but there are risks with keeping schools closed. Families, children, and teachers have different needs. Some can get by with remote learning. Others need in-person learning. Please give families options for both in-person and remote learning. Please give our beloved essential teachers the support and precautions they need to do their job safely. If schools do not open, how will the district meet the needs of children of essential workers? Children of essential workers, including teachers, have less parental presence to support their education at home, and their parents may have to reduce their essential work in order to stay home to care for them. Abby Butchbinder submitted a comment. What metrics will be used determine when in-person instruction will begin or when return to remote learning occur? How often will the situation be re-evaluated? If a family elects in-person learning, but comfort with safety changes, will they be allowed to switch to remote learning if that is an option? If remote learning continues, what will teachers be doing to make it most effective for younger grades? What will childcare options be during the remote or hybrid learning? If childcare options are offered by Evanston or the Park District, will D65 Skokie families be able to participate with resident priority? Sarah Schneider submitted a comment. My questions are based on if District 65 follows protocol and school days similar to other Illinois school districts. In the event we are to return to some type of in-school education, these are questions that I hope will be addressed. 
If students will be staying in their classroom for instructions rather than changing classrooms, how does this affect students that have an IEP and work with other faculty members such as speech, speech pathologists, teacher, social workers, special ed teach, teachers, etc. If a child has an IEP that states that they are to receive two breaks a day during the school day, how will this be implemented during the day? Seeing how students could be under more stress and will not be able to move around as much as they have in the past, how will we be addressing students that have behavioral plans, knowing there is a possibility for more behavioral issues? Will there be new guidelines on when to keep a student home due to illness? And will there be required testing should a student exhibit any type of symptom that could be perceived as symptoms related to COVID? If a student is required to self-quarantine, how will this affect truancy matters? I know there will be many questions that will be submitted. However, I am hoping everyone's questions can be addressed. Lastly, we have a statement uh, joint leadership besides school board. We, the presidents of the union of District 65, are standing together today, representing over a thousand staff. We want to jointly acknowledge and thank Dr. Horton and his team for including us in the planning process for the return of the academic work here. We as union leaders, along with other health experts, recognize that it would be best for students to be learning in an in-person school environment when possible. However, in these times of a global pandemic, we as stakeholders fully believe the social, emotional well-being, health and safety of our staff, students, families, and community are the first priority, along with delivering high quality instruction to our students. We received a copy of the guidance plan and we agree that the district has to begin the year with remote learning given all the unknowns. Moving forward, we are looking for the best methods and proper protocols to ensure a safe and healthy learning environment for our students, staff, and educators. We know that these are unprecedented times and that no solution is going to be easy given the circumstances. We look forward to continued partnership to further operationalize the guidance document and to support the social, emotional, and physical health and safety of our staff, students, and families. Signed, Natalie Copper, President of EACCP, Don Jackson, President of ETAA, Meg Crewley, President of DEC, Dana Smalley, President of DESK, Omar White, Vice President of ECMA. That concludes our public comments. Thank you, Adila, and thank you everyone who took the time to share your thoughts and questions with us. Um, we appreciate your engagement and we appreciate your uh, thoughtfulness. Thank you. All right, Dr. Horton, I'm going to turn it over to, to you and your team for the opening of schools plan session. All right, thank you. So as we're transitioning to the screen, I just wanted to say um, as we heard, the variety of uh, passionate and, and research-focused statements, there is no, there's no one way to do this. So we have collected a lot of information, uh, and we work with a lot of individuals to move this work strategically and to position ourselves so that we can be safe first. So I'm going to start this out. Um, of course, for our school district, Evanston and Skokie, uh, we will be sure that we continue to communicate uh, consistently with you across the board as we're moving. Next slide. The first one, this is, we built some core values that we felt was important as we were designing and building out our, our plan for return to school. With health and safety of students, staff, and community is our top priority. Family and community engagement, caring and supportive culture, systemic culture responsive academic engagement, and transparent communication. Throughout this presentation today, you will see that we have put all of our information into these categories, and this is how we will move forward with our return to school plan. Next slide. First up, we have listening and learning, core values, stakeholder engagement. All right. Our commitment, ensuring decision-making and implementation of return to school plan is transparent, is a transparent process that is inclusive of stakeholder voice with a focus on engaging members of historically marginalized communities 
we've done some outreach uh, to some organizations in the community that uh, were really uh, great allies for us as we were trying to figure out how to uh, make some of these decisions. Our process has been and will continue to be inclusive of all stakeholders, including those from, those from marginalized communities. Community-based return to school task force, teaching and learning task force, and operations task force. Community-based task force will periodically meet to assess progress of our return to school plan. This will be an ongoing process as asked by many of the individuals uh, in the comments today. Engagement with parent community organizations to support community outreach efforts. We've been in conversations with OPAL, BPAC, ABC, and COFI, and we're excited that they are ready to join us in this fight uh, to communicate and, and find out exactly what our, what our community uh, needs are. Use of community outreach suggestions, parent and staff surveys. Kylie. Thank you. Um, our return to work staff survey and the surveys completed by our families and our students have been invaluable resources as we've considered our options. Here you can see um, we're sharing some information about staff concerns related to returning and 95% of our staff either agree or strongly agree that they're concerned about the social emotional impact on students as, as well as the academic impact with 93% of staff uh, reporting that they are concerned or um, very concerned about the um, academic impact on students. Next slide. We also asked staff how they feel when they think about returning to work. And here you see a word cloud of all of the different feelings. And we recognize that this is a huge shift for all of us. And so we've been thinking about how to um, you know, mitigate and address uh, the very real feelings that staff have about coming back to, um, back to school. Next slide. We also wanted to share some information from our family return to school survey. Um, a lot of the family concerns are reflected here. Again, we see that a significant number of families are worried about children's social emotional needs as well as their academic needs. And the number one concern is their child or children being exposed to the COVID-19 virus. Next slide. Additionally, we wanted to um, share some of the mitigation measures that families and community members felt were critically important as we um, return to school. Uh, the number, the num top three things that families wanted to see in place are frequent hand washing, frequent cleaning of high touch surfaces, and then also making sure that we have established a re-exit plan in the event of a surge in coronavirus cases. Next slide. Thanks, Kylie. I think it's also critical to uh, mention which Dr. Horton already explained a little bit about our working uh, groups. And so here's just an example of a group that met primarily on Thursdays as early as uh, the end of May to really start thinking about and drilling down into some of the particulars related to teaching and learning. So a huge shout out and thank you to all of the participants uh, who were invited and were able to participate in those sessions. Next. The other slide here references an operations task force. And so in conjunction with our teaching and learning efforts, we recognize that and prioritize that our in-person instruction needs to have a lot of the answers to the questions that were generated today and the plethora of others that we've been receiving. Huge shout outs to all the participants on this task force as well. Next, it's important to note that we also conducted the superintendent's task force, again, another way to just engage everyone and what our particular options were at the time uh, that this information was released and we wanted to engage stakeholders, hear thoughts and concerns and generate our best ideas through a process that ensured equity of voice and pretty much an open season on, on all thoughts possible to us at that time. 
Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, and, and thank you, Sergio. Um, in his opening comments, he had referenced our superintendent's return to school task force. Um, this was a very diverse group of individuals. Um, we had over 60 people that were representative of all of our collective bargaining groups in District 65. Um, various educators, um, community partners, health officials, um, parents. There are also a lot of community partners um, who represented organizations who were also parents in the district. So there were a lot of people who, who wore multiple hats in their participation. Um, we did host um, eight 90 minute planning sessions, which were from um, early June all the way through, through the end of July. And as Dr. Green mentioned, we use compression planning to facilitate our, our sessions, um, which is really to take big ideas and, and put them into manageable tasks. Um, as we saw in the previous two slides, we just really wanted to acknowledge all of the individuals who um, gave us their, their time, energy, and talents, sharing their best ideas around our various return scenarios, um, which you had seen on the, the previous slide. So group A was focused on schools opening um, with, with no contact limiting, which was basically um, when we enter phase, phase five of, of Governor Pritzker's Restore Illinois plan. Um, return to school scenario B focused on schools opening um, with significant safety hygiene measures. Um, this could include a hybrid model, staggered schedules, different arrival and dismissal times, but basically school would look really different under scenario B. Um, scenario C was focused on schools opening um, and really prioritizing some students um, based on age, academic standing, access to care and, and resources at home. And lastly, group D was, was focused on uh, continuing remote learning. So if it was unable to open schools for in-person instruction, um, that we would, we would continue in remote learning. Thanks, Melissa. Just a reminder about some of the outcomes from our compression process. So since this uh, planning process was used to generate a, a lot of ideas, we had over uh, five to six top ideas related to each scenario. We had three to five top ideas related to calendar adjustments per group. And so while uh, we're actualizing through offering parent choice plans B and D, uh, information from A and C also has helped influence our thoughts in terms of developing the guidance document that you are seeing and referring to, as well as our best thinking at the time and continued dialogue as things are ever changing. So 25 ideas were elevated for consideration and are influencing all of our discussions as we move forward to answer even more questions that, that are being generated. And so some of those return to school plan recommendations, which you may have seen in the guidance document, we know that we need to prioritize our daily social emotional check-ins with all students, recognizing that everyone who might need assistance, um, we wanna be able to serve and offer that support. We also know that the improvement of our range of synchronous and in asynchronous learning opportunities are critically important as referenced today in some of our comments and questions and just learnings from our survey. So studying that information carefully to ensure that we're trying to cover as many bases as possible, really trying to meld and blend the additional academic and social emotional learning supports, uh, tutoring and or therapy for students and families who need it. Uh, it's not mentioned here, but we also want to take into consideration our staff who is also experiencing um, challenges or could be experiencing challenges uh, social emotionally with, with what has been occurring, both with the pandemic and the civil unrest around racial inequities. Um, and we've definitely ensured to partner with Northwestern to provide students with uh, tutoring options who've fallen behind, as well as our efforts within the teaching and learning task force to follow that best guidance that's offered by experts in terms of how to um, incorporate unfinished instruction. All right. All right. Next phase, core value, health and safety first, and also caring and supportive culture. Our commitment, continue to, prior to prioritize the safety and health of all students, staff, and community members following guidelines from ISBE, IDPH, and CDC. 
District staff will prioritize deep, meaningful relationships to create safe learning environments for each child. District staff will empower the value, cultivation of relationships, and belonging of students and parent voice in all aspects of learning and emotional support for families. How do we do this? Face coverings worn at all times, six feet spacing, social distancing, keep groups of students together, hygiene incorporated into daily routine, health assessment, daily temperature checks and CDC questions, increased cleaning disinfecting, limited school visitors, sick protocols, isolation rooms, and PPE support and gear. For caring and supportive culture, commitment. Our design will include supports and structures that will allow students and staff to be cared for physically and mentally. How we are doing this, mental wellness and self-care program, support for our social workers, psychologists, and other educators who may be experiencing, experiencing compassion fatigue, drop-in mediation, access to employee assistance program, flexible work schedules when appropriate and practical and practicable. <clears throat> Accommodations for staff who have indicated that they or family members are at high risk for COVID-19. Flexibility for family to choose learning pathways for each child, remote or instruction or in-person instruction. Combo of five staff institutes slash remote learning days for preparation, training, professional learning prior to school year, all District 65 students will begin the school year in remote learning through at least September 28th. In-person options begin September 29th or after, four days per week, Monday's remote learning for all students, continued monitoring of local and state health conditions, operational planning, and collaboration with staff. More information will be coming with that process and how we'll get to this, to this decision. <clears throat> Key steps, presentation to school leaders and, and union leadership, July 20th, communication to District 65 staff. On the 21st, we shared the presentation to community-based task force, the ones who helped us spearhead this work the most. Um, and then presentation to school board, which is today. Return to school calendar considerations, August 20th through the 21st, 24th through the 26th, Staff Institute days for remote learning planning, no school for students. August 27th, first day of school, remote learning for all students. August 27th through September 28th, remote learning for all students, Monday through Friday. September 29th, in-person learning option begins if it's safe to do, which we will again have a process to determine and be very clear and communicate consistently uh, with the community and our staff of how we're getting to finalize that decision. In-person learning will be Tuesdays through Friday. Mondays will be remote learning. All scheduled half days, school improvement days will be canceled. Amended school calendar must be approved by our school board. Educator and school-based staff. Educator assignments may need to be adjusted due to health considerations and or due to student needs in a given learning model blended or remote. Start and end time of workday may shift for some staff to support student needs. Remote learning, remote work schedules will be made available to educators and school-based staff who are unable to, to report to work in person. Assign staff to an appropriate work schedule that is in compliance with recommended guidelines. Survey staff to determine who is unable to return. Implement staggered work schedules. Next slide. Going back to making sure that we are hitting home on our health and safety protocols, face coverings will be required in all district facilities. Six feet spacing and social distancing, arrival, dismissal, hallway and restroom procedures, hygiene, hand washing and sanitizing, health self-certification and symptom screening process, increased daily cleaning and disinfecting protocols, Visitors' policies will be revisited. Sick protocols and isolation rooms. Positive COVID-19 cases protocols.
Rafael. We recognize that uh, one of the most important things that we can do is to make sure our facilities are ready for in-person reopening. So we've been working on the back end to, to get them ready. What we have done is we have continued to, to disinfect and clean deeply to make sure the buildings are, are in good shape, in a healthy shape for our, our staff and students to come back to. And one of the, uh, we'll be using different equipment, we'll be using disinfectant. One of the equipment that we just acquire right now is electrostatic, and it helps to disinfect on a larger basis on a deeper level to get that done. And we've also been working with our team to make sure that they do a good job of clean eye touch area, where we know a lot of people touch at the same time. We're talking about hand, uh, door handles, end rails, countertop, tables. We want uh, our team to, to clean those very frequently. And what we've also been doing is, as much as we've been training our custodian, our facility staff, we continue to train them based on guidance that are coming out from OSHA and CDC as far as the best way to clean buildings and facility to, to prevent the spread of COVID. And as part of that, we recognize that hair filtration, it's a key way of preventing the spread of the disease. So some of the things that we've been doing and we plan to continue to do is to change the air filter and to calibrate the amount of air that is coming into the building, always coming to make sure those air are pure and filtered and prevent the, the spread of disease. So we've been using the guideline uh, set by CDC as well as the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning. Next. And so in looking at uh, the possibility of when we bring our children back into and our staff back into the facilities, what we've done, we've actually done a study taking into account the six foot social distancing that's recommended. We work with the district architect in looking at the square footage of each space, as well as the existing fixtures and furniture that will occupy the space and what we came up with is based on that six foot uh, setting, this is the uh, maximum capacity that we can have in our building broken down by each of the building. Next one. So one of the key things that we know we need to get under control is that we have to, to make sure our children who come to school are fed and they're fed safely. Our commitment to, to the community right now is We'll continue to serve breakfast and lunch. And uh, we also recognize some of our children suffer with allergy. We will designate part of the classroom. We partition to make sure there's no contamination to our students who suffer from allergy because children will be fed, fed in the classroom. They'll take their lunch and their breakfast in the classroom. We'll make sure they wash their hands carefully before and after food is consumed. And in order to prevent contamination, cross-contamination, we we'll also, what we'll do, we'll serve the food individually. It'll be plated. There will no longer be buffet line, which everyone knows is one of the guidance that was issued by the CDC. And the eating uh, utensils will also be individually packaged. We're recommending that students and staff members bring reusable water filler. But we also know that in some cases, our students or staff would not be able to do that. We plan to provide uh, bottled water to assist with, uh, with that. Uh, there's, uh, there's also a plan in place that we're developing to make sure that parents and family who decide to keep their children at home, we provide a process for them to still have access to food, breakfast and lunch. And we'll also continue to train our students, our staff, to make sure mealtime is safe and we don't run into problem of, uh, of uh, passing out uh, the COVID virus. So we'll continue to do that to make sure that no one gets complacent about the need to, to feed our, our students and also to make the process very safe. Next, please. We know a big part of getting students to school is uh, transporting students. We have approximately 2,500 of our students who ride school buses. And what we know we'll have to do is that the transportation process is gonna look different than the way it looks right now. One of the things that we're committed to doing is making sure that we clean frequently touch area. So there's no transmission there. 
And we do that every time uh, before we load our student onto the bus and after they get out of the bus, we have to train our uh, drivers and also make sure our drivers as well as our students, they wear face mask, that we do some safety protocol like checking to make sure there are no fever uh, inherent in our bus drivers as well as our students. Each of the buses will be assigned a bus aid to make sure that students who are, that the students are going to be assigned their own sitting area, except for folks who live in the same house. When they assign that area, we want to make sure their children that they stay in the area is hard. We know it's hard for students not to socialize. So having a bus aid on each of our buses make it uh, make it easier for that supervision to take place. Next, next slide. So all the things that we've talked about now, we know is gonna cost money. Uh, just to, to touch on the buses that I talked about now, currently our buses have the capacity to be able to, to transport 72 children. Based on the guidance that we have from SP as well as CDC, there's no way we can do that right now. So what we'll need to do, we need to, uh, to, to put fewer students on the bus which will require, require us to, to try to get more buses as well as more, more bus drivers. So looking at the budget ramification of this development, the biggest uh, amount of expenses will be related to those uh, transportation of, of students. We project that right now to be 2.2 million. And the other things that uh, we also need to do to make sure school is safe are PPE as of today, we spend $512,000 on that. We, uh, we bought uh, temperature scanners. So all the things that we bought, if you look at that compared to the CARES Act, amount of revenue that we allocated to get, which is approximately $700,000. Just today, based on what we know, we're looking at uh, a projected deficit of $2.7 million. Part of what we've also been able to do with the planning that we've done where we plan to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, student devices. And instead of that costing us additional money, we've been able to look at the, uh, the leasing plan that we do every year and be able to leverage that and include that in the leasing plan so that there will be no additional expenses that the district will incur. Just to wrap up on the, uh, the budget estimate from, uh, from the planning, there will be additional cost that will be brought on by making sure that the transition is safe and helpful. And uh, that cost, as it stands today, we're looking at an estimated deficit of $2.7 million. Thank you. Core value, systemic, culturally responsive, academic engagement, and caring and supportive culture. Again, educators will engage learners with high quality instruction that is culturally relevant and rigorous. Students will have opportunities to engage synchronously and accuracy during a variety of learning environments and tools. How are we doing this? Design of instructional minutes, selection of instructional materials, provision of student supplies, use of a variety of engagement strategies, teacher preparation and support, ability to demonstrate learning in a variety of options, increase opportunities for feedback and, su and support, committed time for community building and social emotional learning. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Um, as Dr. Horton had mentioned, we are going to be collecting from families their preference for which learning path they would like their children to be engaged in. We will be using the parent portal to collect specific information so that we can look at it for every individual child. What are their specific needs? What are their um, you know, grade level schools to be able to align it with our staffing data and our capacity data for our facilities? In order to achieve this, we are going to be um, providing a lot of supports for our families in how to access this e-form. And we're gonna have a really robust communication plan. Melissa Messenger has done a fantastic job developing this plan in collaboration with um, many of our administrative experts. 
We have also worked closely with our community partners to think strategically about how we can increase awareness in the community and support outreach efforts. I'm now gonna pass it over to Dr. Beardley who will share a little bit more about what learning will look like um, moving forward. Thank you, Kylie, um, and good morning to everybody. Um, I'm gonna take a few minutes to really talk about some of the key principles for our remote learning pathway. And some of these principles are very much shared with on-site learning. Um, as Kylie mentioned, we've spent considerable time reviewing the remote learning survey data, engaging in follow-up follow conversations, and really working to understand what went well and what did not go well in remote learning this spring. As we look at the upcoming school year, we're using this learning to inform our design, both for the remote learning and on-site learning. The feedback centered on the importance of live and recorded interactions, the need for social emotional learning, a desire to better understand learning targets and student progress, as well as ways to increase engagement and relevance for our student body, regardless of their age group. Key design elements as we look forward to this coming year for remote learning include both live, which is synchronous and recorded, which is asynchronous engagement um, and learning. So live and recorded engagement and learning, opportunities to work independently or with peers um, virtually, um, small group support, feedback on student work and access to additional support when needed. Romy will now speak a bit to the early childhood remote learning before we return to K-5 and middle school. Thank you, Dr. Beardsley. Um, first, I would just like to provide some context and thank you to uh, Sharon Sprague for putting this information together. Um, but our pre-K programs serve children birth uh, through age five and they support a high needs population. Um, we have our family center that has our uh, home visiting and early start program. And then our three to five programs um, include Head Start, Preschool for All, and our special ed programming. And uh, before I move on to talking about some specifics, I just wanna share the Head Start and Preschool for All mission, which is to aim to deliver comprehensive, high quality, individualized services, supporting the school readiness of children from low income families and foster creative strategies to meet the complete needs of young children and their families. You can move on to the next slide, please. So our birth to three programs, um, when, when we're ready to, uh, so we're just like um, all of the programs in the district will be starting remotely. Our home visiting program will remain remote um, for now. Uh, our early Head Start classrooms also, uh, when those are ready to reopen, will engage in all of the safety precautions that Dr. Horton and Raphael shared out earlier, uh, but given the close nature um, and close contact that our early childhood staff would be having with the students, uh, there would be some additional precautions and additional uh, PPE that would be used um, when engaging with the, with the families. Additionally, toys and um, material supplies would have to be um, individualized um, and not shared among the children. and. Uh, our students or our, all the children will remain in uh, pods so that they are uh, remaining with consistent groups of, of children and adults. You can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> our uh, three to five programs, again, which, which includes Head Start, our special ed programming and, and preschool for all, will also uh, have uh, all the safety precautions previously mentioned, reduce class sizes to adhere to the six foot social distancing guidelines. And um, within this, as we're looking at potentially reopening, would uh, need to prioritize um, through an intake process, uh, our special education students, and then also our four-year-old students. Move on to the next slide. Again, similar safety precautions would be in place uh, as described in the previous situations and um, increased methods for uh, rigorous and regular cleaning will, will be embedded in uh, the routines for our, our staff. So I think I've covered that. You can move on to the next slide. And it's All back right. to Dr. Beardley. 
Thank you. So this returns us to remote learning in the kindergarten through fifth grade space. Um, a core tenant for our District 65 design is that students will experience and achieve the same learning outcomes regardless of whether they are remote or being educated on site or in a blended environment. Uh, to help this be a re become a reality, we have set we have a set of core principles for remote learning. The first is that there'll be a set start time for the instructional day for students with clear learning routines across the weeks. Students are expected to engage in learning in all subject areas and submit work associated with these learning areas. Content area learning will address grade level learning expectations with attention for any unfinished teaching and learning that may have occurred from last year. Instruction will be provided whole class and in small groups, depending on what is developmentally appropriate. The instruction may be live and recorded, or it may be live. Recordings will be available for students to access if they miss instruction. Live check-ins daily. Live check-ins will occur daily with teachers at a minimum in the form of a morning meeting and an afternoon check-in. Um, which is really set up to see how the day has gone, where, where there may be um, places to reconnect community and to follow up on misconceptions or needed support. Um, educators will monitor engagement and provide feedback on learning while also allowing for limited flexibility for student deadlines with an understanding that when we are learning remotely, individuals are very much in different learning environments and may be able to, may need to access learning at different times. Um, Due to the fact that we will be ensuring that learning devices are in the hands of all kindergarten through eighth grade students and we're committing to getting materials and supplies into the hands of students, we will be returning to um, a form of our more traditional grading policies as we move back into the fall. Um, so those are some of the core tenants for K-5 remote learning. And if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, what we see in the next slide is essentially kind of a glimpse of a possible structure for K-5 remote learning. Um, and as I spoke earlier, um, number one is that there are those two regular check-ins live during the day. And we did hear the voice of those comments prior to the beginning of this board meeting today. And we heard that in our survey feedback from the spring. Um, additionally, calling out the fact that we are engaging across all of the subject areas. That's a shift from the, the spring into the fall. Um, to be, um, the schedules will vary across our schools and grades, which is why we're not providing a specific schedule at this moment, and that we need to determine using staffing models, um, and we'll come closer to the school year starting. Um, and then instruction will be in the form of shorter lessons with opportunities for small group or independent work for students. And that independent work could be independent by themselves or working in collaboration with other students. We are keeping an eye for screen time um, advice and guidance, leaning particularly on the American Pediatrics Association, as well as their revised guidance from this spring, and trying to make sure that the time that is spent taking in learning online will be balanced with some independent opportunities away from the screen. And then fine arts and PE will be, be provided in designated times daily um, with a lens for create, increasing the engagement and interaction from what we saw in the spring. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Okay, and if we think about the instructional day and what might be within that day, this is a glimpse of just kind of the way those interactions could look and the way that we're thinking about the time. We want to ensure that that morning meeting has kind of a daily hook and has that social emotional learning lesson because we want to bring kids into our community. We want to welcome them. We want to get us excited for the day. There will be PE and physical fitness. Um, when we are on site, we are specifically going to be paying attention to some of those brain breaks and opportunities to be able to kind of step outside, remove masks, kind of work to build a commute of environment that's going to keep kids connected to learning and have a degree of balance. Um, we are looking at how do we blend our reading, writing, phonics, social studies into a larger humanities learning um, in order to try to kind of create a stronger coherent set of learning in that space and similarly doing some of that thinking about math and science. Um, we will continue with fine arts engagement. When we are on site, that most likely will be video streamed into the classroom because as has been spoken to by Dr. Horton, Raphael and Romy, we are going to be keeping kids in reduced size pods and limiting the amount of movement around the school building. And so 
the instruction that may be in, provided by an instructor beyond the core homeroom teacher would be most likely streamed or recorded for viewing within the classroom to limit the amount of contact that we have with others in the building. And then we wanna be able to end with that afternoon check-in closing circle so that we can understand how the day went and frame what's coming for the next day. So that's focused on building some of the routine and connection that families were looking for. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, shifting over to 6-8, what I really just wanna call out here is the guiding principles are the same in K-5 and 6-8. Um, and for those that may look specifically to 6-8, and I just wanna re-elevate the fact that the goal is to ensure that learning is the same in a remote learning environment as well as on site. Um, it is our goal to provide high quality learning and to support students so that we can be um, essentially getting a year or more's worth of learning within the, in this, this upcoming school year. Um, important points for middle school families and middle schoolers to understand is that a minimum we will have these check-ins. There will be engagement in all content area, uh, areas. There will be opportunities to connect live and or recorded to content. Our instruction will be focused on shorter lessons with independent release and small group work. Um, and then this applies both to K-5 and 6-8. We will continue to use our learning systems, ST Math, Reading A to Z, IXL, Newzella, in order to create extended learning opportunities as well as to be able to give kids more on the spot feedback on how they're doing on standards aligned skills. Um, so those are just a couple of key points, but the design tenants for remote learning in K-5 and 6-8 are the same as illustrated in this slide. And if we could go on to the next slide, please. All right, so again, this is a possible structure because we are going to need to build our structures with our individual schools as we think about student and educator assignments. Um, for our middle schoolers, we know feedback wise, mornings were a struggle, struggle for our middle schoolers in the spring. Um, we did some consideration about whether we could be adjusting starting times, but it presents challenges with busing um, and a return to on-site learning. And so it is important to understand that school will start at 8.30 a.m. for our middle schoolers. And we do need some support getting our kids connected and engaged to that learning. Um, and we are going to use that instructional day. Um, kids will be checking in and getting lessons as we move through the day. We will have live and recorded, live and or recorded lessons. So students that may have to miss a session will be able to access it later. Content will be across all subjects again, um, and the schedules will vary a bit by school as we work to develop the individual, um, individual site-based um, instruction. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. All right, and at this point, this is a sa potential sample schedule for on-site learning. We are still very much in the process of doing this, but I think the important things to raise up are that we are looking for opportunities for kids to be engaging in all subjects while also building in the necessary breaks for kids. A middle school model will also be set up in it with a smaller pod or a smaller group of students. Class sizes will be limited and most likely a group of students will be have, we will have anywhere from six to eight sections that will be taught by a group of four to six teachers. And so that will be kind of a self-contained group to limit the amount of contact again across adults and students. And so those schedules will feel will be more modified and well, in some ways we'll have several smaller groups where one group of educators are working with a committed, a defined set of students and all the educators are working with the same students. If I could go on to the next slide, please. Romy, I think we're back to you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so what I'd like to start off with for our students with IEPs and 504s, um, parents and educators can expect that uh, we, we learned a lot from, from how things went in the spring and there will be a significant increase in the uh, daily interaction that our students would have with their special service providers. Um, uh, and specifically when we surveyed families, uh, it was very clear that the most helpful 
component of the students learning was when they were able to have live interactions and um, experiences with their service providers. So that will be a priority priority as we move um, into uh, this school year. We are still responsible for providing a free and appropriate public education and making sure that we're addressing the individualized needs uh, because this school year will look different. Uh, all of our students who had IEPs in the spring uh, would have received an individualized remote learning plan and those will need to be updated uh, for this school year uh, to address the increase in expectations uh, for student learning. The um, when we're ready to return to school safely, as we think about uh, who can return, our students with IEPs and 504, 504 plans would be prioritized for in-person instruction. When that happens, we'll be um, utilizing a COVID impact transition plan, which um, has some questions so that we can uh, dive in and really understand the impact. Um, each student who uh, has been at home is experiencing uh, having a different experience and we wanna make sure that we're individualizing the supports that we put in place uh, as we move forward. Additionally, our paraprofessionals will be utilized uh, differently as we move into the school year to provide increased access and support. We will continue to adhere to all the state federal guidelines. There's been no flexibility uh, for us on that. And even if, if and when we do return, Turn to school in person. The plan is as much as possible to continue to hold meetings remotely. Um, for our educators, we uh, know that we want to prioritize and find ways to have our general educators and our special educators have opportunities to collaborate and how they're supporting uh, students. For all students with IEPs, we do have the responsibility to ensure equitable access to grade level standards and without our general ed counterparts uh, that that is a lot harder, so we need to work together. We are planning for some focused professional learning opportunities, specifically around um, improving our telehealth opportunities, strengthening the online instruction platforms that we've been using, and trauma and healing. Uh, as has been previously mentioned, we will, um, because our students with IEPs oftentimes are leaving the classroom or going to get services, we're putting uh, plans in place to minimize the amount of travel so that students and staff are staying with consistent uh, groups. Uh, for some of our students, who might be deaf or hard of hearing or have uh, impacted by speech language needs. We are we have ordered masks that have clear facial uh, shields uh, to support those students and staff. You can move on to the next slide. Uh, we also uh, are considering some of our special populations and our students who attend uh, special programs like Park, Rice, our communication development classrooms and our options programs and thinking about how we can increase, similar to um, uh, some of the extra precautions we would take in our early childhood program where we need, we might need to have some close contact. So we are looking at increased PPE for the safety of our, our staff and students, smaller teacher student ratios if and when we're ready to return. Uh, we got a lot of feedback about uh, the supports that families need at home to um, support their child. So if and when it is safe and, and we can put some uh, very clear safety precautions in place looking at home visits to better support our families and students uh, when they're not in school. You can move on to the next slide. Uh, moving on to our emergent bilingual population, uh, similar to our students with IEPs, this is a group of students where we would prioritize in-person learning opportunities when uh, we are able to return to school. Uh, our teachers would differentiate supports, uh, specifically looking at our students uh, who recently arrived, uh, might have had limited or interrupted uh, formal education, and those uh, students who are receiving interventions our uh, educators would make sure that they're facilitating opportunities for interactive dialogue with native English speakers, peers, and adults around academic content, um, and then uh, also available uh, bilingual counseling and uh, support in that area. Uh, we'll work closely with our bilingual parent advisory committee to further explore how we can uh, better support uh, this student population. Can move on to the next slide. 
uh, again, uh, expect similar to um, everything that's been talked about, there will be increase uh, in expectations in terms of any services provided and really should be thinking about how we're mirroring that support, uh, very similar to what it might have been looked like before uh, schools were closed. So educators will continue to apply the, the standards and we can do descriptors, uh, scaffolding support for assignments, uh, uh, also looking at clear uh, windows for facial masks, um, encouraging uh, home language, uh, utilizing the native language in interactive things like television, radio, and social media to continue native language learning, uh, increasing outreach opportunities for with our multilingual families that we know we had difficulty reaching um, in the springs who might need support with some of those online platforms. And then again, continuing to think about how we scaffold and provide support mm -hmm. for, for families. Okay. Uh, so this is a long uh, slide with a lot of information. I will just summarize, um, but it's been named a couple uh, multiple times here, the impact that not only uh, our global pandemic is having, but also uh, the persistent racial inequities that our um, students, families, communities, and our country are experiencing. And we know that um, um, at the top of our priority list is thinking about how we are supporting our students and our educators and our families um, from a social emotional lens. Uh, what I like about this quote from Castle, and thank you Donna Cross for finding this, is the, um, and this has been um, discussed a number of times in the district about how this is a good opportunity to reimagine, reimagine what supports uh, for students uh, look like in our schools. Uh, so uh, I wanna thank also everybody who participated in the task force because I really felt that sense of community and support for each other because we know uh, we have a lot to do and accomplish and um, this is gonna be a hard year, but I just want everybody to know that uh, social emotional learning and supporting the, the mental well being of our uh, learning community is a priority. We can move on to the next slide. A few ways uh, that we currently are planning to address that in terms of adult support, is, uh, healing spaces and self care programs for our educators and staff. Uh, we're working on some professional learning modules that can be done uh, individually. Um, uh, ongoing intentional training uh, for our educators around um, trauma-informed practices with a heavy emphasis on healing. And there are toolkits that are being created, ready to use that educators can roll out uh, for students. Um, as Stacy mentioned in her, um, in the sample schedules that we're building in daily SEL activities and check-ins, um, mm -hmm. mindful activities. We continue to have the support of our amazing social workers and other mental health uh, professionals in our buildings. Um, again, if and when uh, it's deemed safe and, and we can have the proper precautions in place, uh, how, thinking about how we can support families at home. Um, and then also we're looking at uh, a screening tool that we can use to be used to further assess uh, where our students are, are coming in and what individualized supports we might be able to provide. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to speak a little bit to our electronic device plan. Um, we have a couple things that were have come up in our conversation here. Um, based on the feedback both from our first survey and our latter survey. Um, in our latter survey, we asked the community if the expectation was that a student had an individual device to engage in remote learning, we asked, we assessed the need there. Based on the response to that survey, we, as Raphael mentioned earlier, have managed to move to secure some additional devices. And we are going to a plan where students from kindergarten through eighth grade will have access to an individual device. Um, and this will suppo support both remote and return to on-site learning due to some of the um, COVID safety requirements around sharing of materials. Um, so we are currently working on securing those devices and defining a distribution plan that will um, work both with individuals that already have devices from District 65, as well as for students um, to get a device from District 65. Most likely that distribution will be coordinated with the distribution of student supplies and materials that will be needed to launch remote learning 
um, for the first month, as well as to support our ongoing remote learning or on-site learning um, dependent upon the start date. And so you can look for communication from District 65, both on device distribution and material school supply material distribution. Um, additionally, a strong voice from the return to school task force was that we needed to look at additional opportunities for providing training and support for um, families and students who have to use devices at home. So we are partnered up with our family engagement team in District 65 um, and reaching out and connecting with some community-based partners as well with the goal of being able to provide, um, to provide uh, um, both live as well as remote, well, recorded trainings for families both on device usage as well as usage of some of our learning platforms, signing on, accessing learning. And so we are strengthening those degree of supports both through live access and recorded access to trainings in addition to ensuring that there are more devices in the hands of our students for accessing learning, accessing learning going forward. We can go on to the next slide, yes. Um, and actually I spoke a little bit to the family training here as well. Um, I think the important things to realize are the items that we've called out underneath. You know, we want people to understand system requirements. We are also going to continue where needed to support Wi-Fi access in homes. We strongly encourage families and we'll be communicating this in an ongoing manner to take a look at some of the reduced cost uh, Wi-Fi options that are available through our providers in the community. And then for families where that is not feasible, we are looking to make sure that those families have Wi-Fi access to be able to access learning. Um, trainings will be focused on both Chromebooks and iPads. We are focused on using iPads in K2, Chromebooks in third through fifth grade, and iPads in middle school as we continue with our access to innovate programming. We will have a designated learning platform um, Pre-K through second grade will be using Seesaw and Google Classroom will continue in 3.8. So we will provide training opportunities for families and students to be able to better understand those platforms, um, to communicate in those platforms and to be able to submit work and get feedback through those platforms. Um, additionally, due to the fact that our students are um, spending a good deal of time on technology devices, we are also strengthening our scope of sequence around digital safety and citizenship and we will provide some of that training and learning to our family and communities as well um, to ensure that we are creating um, strong digital citizens and keeping our students safe in the process of engaging and learning. And we can move on to the next slide. Organizational alignment, spotlights, and essential systems. Andalib and Terrence. Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to share with you some of the news around this. As you've heard this morning, a lot of the ambitious plans that we're talking about are gonna really require a profound level of attention to the details of how we work together. Um, in District 65, we've really embraced this idea that a system is this powerful aggregation of independent, interdependent processes that when implemented with fidelity, produce a cohesive synergy for, that happens between teaching and learning. Um, we appreciate that our school leaders joined together with cabinet and led by Dr. Horn um, about two weeks ago, we participated in training around some of our spotlight systems. And uh, um, next slide, please. Good morning, good afternoon. So right now I'm just gonna break the air a little bit where everybody know I don't see any smiles. So I'm just say this so I can get some smiles and I know it's a long presentation and we're near the end. So get a little smile in there. But right now we're gonna talk about system one. Now system one and most of the systems gonna give you a little, little um, synopsis over the purpose and the belief. So in system one, the purpose is to align teaching and learning with rigorous standards. So once again, we wanna align everything. We wanna kind of look at it and while we're aligning, we're trying to make sure that we're touching distance learning and in-school learning. We wanna make sure everything is touched. Now, the belief about system one is the fact that all students must be able to demonstrate high levels of learning, mastery, and application of all Illinois learning standards. This serves as the foundation for instructional transformation and informs every other system in this process. So system one is very important because of the fact that it is the, it is the starting point. And our systems, just look at it as our skeleton. 
And we want to make sure that we have each and every bone in our body so that way we can always build. All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, you're looking at spotlight system too. And one of the things I want to always, I'm going to always start off with is the purpose. The purpose of the system is to improve performance by analyzing and acting on the evidence. Once again, we're talking about evidence. We were talking about what our data is telling us. We, and we're talking about quantitative data and qualitative data. We wanted to look at our surveys. We're looking at all forms of data. That is considered our evidence. All right, the belief of system two is the collection, analysis, and use of key data points that inform academic and non-academic decisions. Because once again, as we understand, we're trying to educate the whole child. So we're not only trying to touch them academically, but we're also trying to touch them non-academically. Next slide. So Spotlight System 3 is really prioritizing the importance of collaboration, planning, and instruction, and really bringing together all these elements that you've heard together so far. Within that, our goal is that this system is that we're going to prioritize that our teachers and work together to plan and instruct, instruct together for with complexity, um, breadth represented in the grade level standard in order to adequately design learning experiences that are rigorous and advanced student skills and knowledge. To that end, we, we've asked our school leaders will be collaborating with educators to ensure that we are monitoring, coaching, and supporting feedback for collaborative teams and working with them to ensure that they're using rubrics, both to evaluate their effectiveness as a team, but also the work that they are doing. We are also working with uh, curriculum and instruction uh, who will be in introducing performance matters to really help ensure that we have standardization of our academic standards across um, our system, as well as looking at the formative assessments that are involved. It's gonna be really important to that end um, that we are collaborating with our teachers to make this a reality. Next slide, please. Spotlight system four. So spotlight system four is really about highlighting the way in which we wanna pay attention to what our students are actually producing in the classroom, both in person or virtually. All of these systems, I just wanna underscore, we believe strongly can occur um, and can be operationalized both in a virtual space and an in-person space. And so that is, a, that is a, uh, I just want to underscore that we are seeing this as important across all spaces. So system four will be really operationalized by thinking about the way in which our teachers collaborate together to intentionally focus on the student achievement gap and the racial inequities that occur. And together they will be analyzing student work and look at the way in which the progress data um, emerges using an equity lens, uh, specifically ra racial equity analysis protocol. Uh, we envision that leaders will play an important role in ensuring that that analysis of assessment occurs and there's attention to the way in which we have to be culturally sensitive and more importantly, really lift the priorities around um, those, those backgrounds that come out of that. Next system, please. All right, System 5. Once again, the purpose of System 5 is to provide all students with equitable learning opportunities. Once again, there is a big difference between equality and equitable. And that is something that is a big shift in education that we're trying to shift from. We're trying to get away from equality and get into more equitable type of things. Uh, the belief about it is when provided the appropriate support, all students can be academically and behaviorally successful. Because once again, we're talking about appropriate supports, not equal supports, because some will need a little more than the others, some will need a little less. But it's just making sure that we individualize our uh, education for each and every student. Next slide. Our last spotlight is to promote continuous instructional improvement. Once again, continuous, that's something I talked about earlier. We should always be continuously trying to learn something each and every day. And we're trying to make sure our students get into that habit each and every day. The belief around it is an effective system for observing and coaching teachers throughout the year to improve instructional practice and inform professional development. This is a very important right now during COVID because we're developing it right now as to how we're going to start uh, observing teachers and observing our instruction being a distance lens. Next slide. All right. 
Thank you. Informing our community, core value around transparent communication. Our commitment, build awareness and understanding of District 65's return to school plan through the delivery of relevant, timely, and accessible information through a variety of information channels. Further engage stakeholders by offering opportunities for two-way dialogue and feedback to better meet their diverse needs. Support district and school level efforts to improve student outcomes, specifically students from marginalized communities. Continue collaboration with District 65 department teams and community partners to increase awareness of supports and resources for students, families, and staff. One thing that will be happening that's coming, more information for our staff, we will actually be doing um, a listening session with me uh, with the feeder schools and more information to come. And then we'll also do some other community um, town halls, learning more about the needs of the community. So I wanna move on to the next slide. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Um, we recognize that communication is, is fundamental to what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, as all of my colleagues mentioned today and the board acknowledged, um, this is um, the first time that we're doing any of this. Um, so communication uh, for both families as, as well as our staff is going to be critical uh, to being successful with both of our learning pathways. So we are really going to take a multifaceted approach to our communication efforts. This is going to be a all hands on deck uh, approach, not just in within our organization, but also within the community. We talked to our 60 task force participants yesterday about um, really asking for their support and engaging families around both the learning options for the fall as, as well as all of the different changes to the school day and how we can best support uh, meeting students' academic and, and social emotional needs, as well as really supporting our staff um, and ensuring that they feel comfortable and, and confident in, in their work. Um, so one of the ways that we, I just wanted to highlight that we're going to do this also is through the creation of some communication toolkits to support uh, community leaders and partners. Um, we have many members of our faith-based organizations across the community who have reached out to Dr. Horton and said, hey, let us know how we can help. How can we do this? So um, the creation of various messages that can be shared on, in different community bulletins or, or verbally as part of services, text messages, social media campaigns that can be sent. Um, we also recognize that we can't just rely on email and people coming to our website. So we really need to engage everyone in, in what we're, we're putting forward. So this will be a lot of personal outreach too, a lot of phone calls directly to families from principals and staff and really trying to uh, engage across all, all layers of the organization. So we will be using every single tool at our disposal. We encourage people to let us know if, you know, information is not reaching them or how we can better, better, better serve them moving forward. All right, we are at the end of our presentation and I just wanted to highlight some references. Um, this PowerPoint will be made public uh, so that you will have time to see it and go through it. Uh, we follow, follow state guidelines and CDC guidance to make informed decisions and plan accordingly. Review other foundational resources to inform plan for school safety, acceleration of learning outcomes, culturally sustaining practices, social emotional learning and other considerations for returning to school in the fall. The list includes the guidance of, that we'll review that we use throughout this entire time. And I also would just like to say again, um, the purpose in our delayed, uh, delayment, delayed to start on the 29th is that we, and all, we're being very honest, we have quite a bit of work to do in regards to getting our building safe. We also wanna make sure that our staff is comfortable and uh, okay with, with our structure as well as our students. And so that timeline will allow us to do all the intricate details to get our buildings ready. Uh, we are expecting potential surges to happen. Uh, we will monitor that closely. And again, more information will be coming on how we're going to phase into um, the, the hybrid model. It was not, uh, it's not something that we took lightly. We understand many districts are venturing and opening their doors on day one. We as a district know that there's so much more work to be done at our buildings to get them to get our students and our to make sure that our students and our staff are safe. So thank everyone, and I'm sorry we went over our time by roughly 15 minutes, but this we had to give uh, as much detail as many details as we possibly could in this presentation. And thanks again.
to all of our team, staff, community members, anyone who participated, and definitely our school board. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was having some technical difficulties. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, we are over time, but I did also want to ensure that we have the opportunity for board members to inquire publicly about the presentation. So I would like to do that quickly. Um, we may not have time to discuss all of the responses, but if you all could prioritize a couple of the responses that either are trending or that you think are um, most important for us to, or relevant to types of questions that the public has, um, I'd really appreciate that. Tua, yes. Hi, thank you, uh, Anya and uh, Dr. Horton. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone involved in the plan. I know how much work um, and thought it took to put all of these details together. Um, and I, I think I just want to make a couple of comments and then I had a quick question, of, um, a logistical question. <clears throat> I think um, one of the things I've realized when I reviewed the plan is that we do have to let go of our expectations, uh, our pre-COVID before time expectations about what school was gonna be like. I think both the remote learning and the uh, hybrid model that will come online at the end of September are gonna be very different uh, school experiences for our children than what we maybe imagine and crave for them. Um, but I think you know, in that difference, I hope that we'll take an opportunity to um, see the potential and see this as, an uh, a transformative moment, not just uh, a loss, um, but an opportunity to maybe reinvent some of the models of learning and try out new tools. Um, I'm really interested in what Stacy talked about with the integration of reading, writing, and social studies and what that looks like, a, a kind of integrated humanities curriculum. Um, so I think there are transformative possibilities here, and I hope that we will all in addition to grieving what we've lost, also open ourselves up to uh, creative solutions. Um, so I thank everyone for the work and I hope you can continue to collaborate in that. Um, and I think whatever we do, this is a learning opportunity and I hope we'll take full advantage of that. Um, the, the very practical question I have is, I know the will be remote until September 29th, but when will uh, parents need to decide the pathway that, that we're going. I know there was a date in a previous communication, but I don't know if that timeline has changed. Thank you. Kylie, can you address that please? Yes, yeah, so today we will open up the electronic form in Parent Portal for parents to identify the pathway. And we're asking that parents identify the pathway by July 31st. We recognize that this is a very um, tight timeline but we need that information in order to be able to do um, you know, the triangulation of our data between our staffing, our capacities, and our student um, return pathways. And so that's the timeline that we're looking at. And our school leaders are prepared to um, provide supports, to do direct outreach, and we have a lot of um, plans in place to be able to support that in a, in a way that is successful. Thank you. Yeah, Joey, thanks. Um, I also want to thank everyone uh, for all the hard work. Um, I know on the, the cabinet side and the task force side, there was a lot of uh, sacrifice, uh, family time, and uh, that, that calm summer moment that didn't happen because you've been planning the details um, of what's going into place now. Um, I also wanted to just clarify that this is this is a best case plan right now until we get to stage five of the Restore Illinois plan that the governor has put out. 
and that stage five plan doesn't come until there's a vaccine. So this is this is where we are until until science catches up with COVID-19. Um, and I think that's really important to what Sulas had said about kind of re recalibrating our expectations um, and setting ourselves here for, you know, the, the thing I wrote down was be prepared for the long game. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful actually that we're delaying the start of in-person learning for a little bit to see how things play out in other communities because I don't think that our children and our staff and our community needs to be the test case. Um, I also know that I say that with a, with a bit of privilege of my own that uh, I feel like I can figure it out and not everybody can so easily. So um, there's gonna be costs all around. Um, but, but thank you for the work that you've done. Um, I think after today, it's about to get a lot harder and a lot faster. So thank you for the work you're about to do. Um, and a special shout out to Melissa because uh, it's been a lot of communication on your part, um, clarifying all the different things that everyone's been saying um, and making sure that it gets out in a cohesive manner to everybody. So that does not go unnoticed. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Appreciate that. Thanks, Joey. Sunny, I think I saw your hand. Yeah, um, you know, I think Sula and Joey really captured um, sort of the, the flexible thinking of the moment that I think we all need to have. Um, and I would stress that. I think that's something that as parents, as teachers, as administrators, um, you know, one thing that as I looked through this plan that that struck me is it does feel like there is so much that we are trying to do. It, it felt a little bit like we were trying so hard to create as quote unquote normal of an experience as possible in these times that are anything but normal. Um, and so I just want us all to take a step back and really think about what that means and what the realistic goals are. And I, I don't mean that we should have lower expectations. I think we need to have high expectations for ourselves and for educating our kids um, and providing for their, particularly providing for their social emotional needs through this time. But, you know, I, I think we have to really think through things like assessments and, and um, you know, just there's some, rigidity that I think we need to make sure that we're not overly tied to certain things. We have to be flexible and fluid as the moment um, necessitates and frankly, as our children ne necessitate. And we need to be able to give our teachers and our principals and you know educators, paraprofessionals, the flexibility to really understand in the moment what our kids need um, and to respond to that um, and not necessarily be worrying about how does that fit into, you know, the assessment schedule or the instructional minute schedule or, or whatever. I mean, these are, are, I think that kind of flexibility on all of our parts um, is really going to be critical moving forward. Um, and thank you. I mean, this has been a, a, in some ways an impossible task that you've all had to undertake. Um, I feel so lucky that in our district, I think we really do have the best minds in the game. Um, doing this. And so I thank each and every one of you for, for everything you're bringing to this. I, I, I just, I can't even express, you know, I, I keep telling people we are making the least bad decision here. There are no good decisions. All we can do, and I think Biz alluded to this, is, is try as much as possible to reduce harm. But we know there is harm. This is a pandemic. We are all experiencing trauma at some level. And so I'm sorry, I mean, you might hear the emotion in my voice because I think this is such a difficult decision and I just appreciate all of you so much. Um, so the kind of going to Sula's practical question of needing, parents needing to make this decision about which pathway they wanna take um, by July 31st. I understand why as a district, we need that information as quickly as possible to be able to make some planning decisions. As a parent, I'm going to implore on behalf of our parent community um, and our educators, because I don't know if it's also true, I, I'm not a, or in staff in general. I, I think there's still some question for me about what kind of choices our staff has in terms of, of returning and not returning and whether that 
choice looks different amongst different bargaining units. Um, but I, I think it's a, this is a lot of information to take in. I think as we saw from the public comments, there are a lot of questions. I think we need to probably do some sort of town hall question and answer type of thing um, before we ask people to make this choice. Um, and I think also really understanding that we do need to prioritize some children and families in the in-person option, right? We, we are, there are many of us who maybe we want to send our kids back to in-person school because it's not easy being the homeschool teacher. But um, for many of us, we still need to make that choice to keep our kids at home so that we can prioritize the, the families that don't have the similar choice or whose children's do have children do have more specific needs that that can be best served um, in an in-person environment. So I, I, it's just, you know, that's three days from now. It's not a lot of time. If there's any flexibility on that, um, I urge us to, to think about it. Um, do I have the dates right? Eight no, days. I'm sorry. It's yeah, a week like nine time. days. I'm sorry. I don't know what time or day it is anymore these days. So my apologies. It's still a week is still a very tight time frame. So I think that as much time as we can give um, families and make sure that we have opportunities for families and staff to ask their questions um, to make the best decision for them and for the district as a whole would be helpful. Yeah, Rebecca. Thanks, Sunny. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you to all for all your hard work, all your dedication. Um, this is an extremely difficult meeting, I think, for, for all of us. We are not um, making any decision that we feel is, is the best decision, as Suni said, but um, it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to reimagine how we as a community come together to lift each other up. So in thinking about the instruction that's being given, if there's any way that we can create some sort of community building uniformity around the lessons that are being provided by school, by grade, um, I think it will enable parents to support one another, to have neighbors be able to talk about the same thing. Um, I've heard of school districts that are um, reading the same book, you know, uh, finding creative ways to, to, to um, foster community um, for a very difficult time um, that our community is going through. So um, in terms of, of in innovation, you know, I know that we have very many innovative teachers who, you know, who, who are biting at the bit to, to, um, to explore the options and who might be better in technology and just really um, supporting those instructors, supporting that type of instruction. Um, and again, creating as much as possible um, a sense of community in a time where we're, uh, where we're isolated. Um, I'm extremely concerned about the safety of our children and how, um, in, in addition to the social emotional well being that has been brought up, how we're checking on children and how we're checking in on households is something that is of extreme concern to me, um, especially with the financial challenges that are being had by very many people in our community who don't have the resources um, to provide you know, the supplemental um, support, um, instruction, equipment, um, everything that's needed. Um, the, you know, the incredible economic stress that is, on, that is on our community right now. And that is also on our school district. Um, we have, and we, we, you know, um, while we haven't talked about it in a while, we still have referendum funds that are gonna run out and it's not something fun that we like to talk about. Um, it's something that we had started at the end of the, uh, the uh, at the beginning of last school year, and how we bring bring in the community to talk about that, and uh, realizing that we have some very difficult decisions to make ahead of us, and reimagining our education with the funds that we will have available uh, once we come out of this, um, you know, th this pandemic, whenever th that does happen. Um, so just in, ensuring again that through the work that we're doing, um, communication. You know, we've said we've said it uh, once and twice. Um, you know, through this, and I'm, you know, I'd be remiss to um, to point out that we we won't have this information available to our Spanish speakers today. Um, I don't know when, but I hope that we're able to have this information translated as soon as possible, and to really help um, the families that uh, that need to be in the classroom. 
um, that we really somehow prioritize um, those children um, and the needs of those students. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that we could spend uh, the next few days in gratitude to all of you for all the work that you have done. I know that none of you have the time for to sit here for us to thank you the way that you need to be thanked for all of the work, but I want to acknowledge that. And I also want to um, just show my great admiration for the fact that despite the pressures of what the high school is doing or what universities are doing, that you stayed very centered on the fact that our math is different, that what uh, K through eight children and families need is different. And so we can't just use the solutions that other folks are using because we have just a, a very different um, requirements and, and, and harm that can be uh, done by having not the right options. So thank you for, for not just kind of going with the flow or going with pressure that exists other places. Um, I, I want to echo what, what some of the board members have said, Rebecca and Sunia in terms of, and Sula, in terms of, you know, this is an opportunity. We don't have to go back to flawed systems. We haven't served our black and brown children the way that we need to. And so I hope that we take every opportunity we can to reimagine and reconstruct and, and not just figure out a way to go back to what we were doing last year once the pandemic is over because that wasn't working. Um, from a, from a more logistical standpoint, and I know that this was identified in the presentation that this is coming, but I do think it will be very important for us to have a collaboration with a testing agency and very clear protocols about what is going to happen if any one individual student, staff member, family member um, does test positive for COVID and have be very transparent as to what that will look like for the classroom, for the school, et cetera. Um, you know, I think we're gonna need to have very clear metrics of what, what we're using to determine when they come back in person, if we have to go back remote, kind of all of those things. So um, I know that that's, that was identified in the presentation, but I'm sure parents want to hear that like that is being created and that there will be, um, there will be very clear protocols that we will be following with recommendations from IDPH and, uh, and other CDC and other organizations because I um, I know that everybody is concerned about kind of the contingencies of safety um, and providing those protocols I think will help everyone know it be understand what what to expect when these things you know if and when these things do occur so um, as Joey said I know there's a lot more work to come so thank you for what you've already done but thank you for what the next six months are going to ask of you um you know you know we have a new superintendent who came in uh, in probably the most difficult circumstances of any new transition lots of new staff members and i just appreciate all the hard work you're doing to to reduce the harm as much as possible and and reimagine what we can do for our students so thank you thank you Betty. um yeah Jen. I just want to say one more thing that's not directly related to this plan, but about the work forward and reimagining things. Um, public schools have always been an amazing place to produce uh, citizens who are engaged and um, informed. And we're not a place where we tell kids how to vote, but we encourage them to vote and to be active participants in their society. So we need that from parents right now. And we need to get schools that can be engaged um, where people can feel like they do have the ability to advocate for themselves. Um, but it's also a place where we need to nourish, um, nurture a love of science. And um, we, we seem to put other subject areas sometimes ahead of uh, science and social studies. And this, if nothing else, is a great moment for us to reimagine our schools where we are um, lifting up science and social studies because uh, those are the areas where we seem to be failing ourselves. Um, and not being able to solve these problems and solve these crises. Um, schools are not built to be the avenue for kids to be fed, for people to have their technology. These are systems that are in place that is not just the public school's responsibility. Um, and so while we're all um, hunkered down, we can find ways to advocate to our local and state officials, but also to our federal government and um, get on the horn about those issues as well. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Horton. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say, um, this is really valuable, really good feedback that we're receiving from, from the board. 
I just wanted to highlight that there is a uh, companion document, a reimagined school document, it's about 21 pages um, that's going out today to families. And that, uh, that is actually, uh, we have that in Spanish as well. Uh, we forgot to mention that in our conversation uh, today. So that will be going out when we do send the survey. And it's a little, it's, it's detailed uh, and it should, pro it should provide the same type of information uh, that we discussed today. So um, thanks for that. And then the other piece is again, um, everyone, it, it, we, we wanna reimagine, you know, how we do school. Uh, and so thanks for, uh, you know, the, the reassurance that we have the green light to do that. <laughs> so thank you. Just a quick comment uh, and uh, again, thank, thank you all for all the work that you've done. Again, this is, again, unprecedented, right? Uh, and uh, just to reiterate and kind of piggyback on what Joey was saying and everybody else is saying around reimagining education. Again, I, for, for about 20 to almost 30 years, we've been chasing um, standardized math and, um, and, and reading test scores. And where has that gotten us? Um, it's gotten us to you children, and particularly marginalized children, children of color, children who, in the families who have had no resources uh, to be able to, um, you know, achieve at the highest levels that folks with resources do have. Um, you know, it's just increased the gap. Uh, and we have to rethink how we think about children. Uh, and, and we really, really have to consider that all children and all families have the innate talent and resources and drive and resilience and push to be able to be productive citizens in the society. And it's systems and institutions and laws that have held us back. So as we think about this, you know, you know I know there's requirements from the federal government around reading and math scores, right? It's okay to be rebellious now, nowadays. We need to push back. Our children are more than reading math test scores. And we need to be chasing, instead of test scores, we need to be chasing how children can collaborate and work like on science and social studies and to help us solve the problems that we're facing today and tomorrow and to make a more equitable and just society in the world. This is where it starts. If we have to take a stand against some federal requirements, then this is the time to do it. And that way we can change and then we can go out and vote like, like uh, you know, Joey saying to, to make sure those changes are sustainable uh, and, and really create a better society for all. So again, this is where it starts in these classrooms, in these school districts. So as parents, we need to go out there and, and advocate for uh, better education policy from, from, from our elected officials. Um, as educators, again, we need to be creative and try to find ways to ensure that we're connecting with children be that home visits, co-teaching, however we can, uh, but you know, again, doing whatever we can at, 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 as citizens to reimagine and transform society in a way that's equitable and has equitable outcomes for all. You're muted, Anya. Okay, can y'all hear me now? Okay, great. Sorry. Um, thank you, Sergio. And I have some additional um, questions and comments that I think overlap in some ways. Um, I just want to drive home that I share them. Um, and one of them is related to, but maybe a little tangential to what Sergio was just saying, which is um, when we're thinking about preparing for culturally responsive conversations, I really encourage us to think about how we incorporate the current context of social unrest in our country into those conversations um, and into those learning experiences, including when we're reflecting on trauma and how to have trauma-informed responses the type of racial, ethnic, economic exclusion um, animus to the LGBTQ community that we're seeing on a national level is traumatic. And I think it's traumatic to, to everyone. It's, it's, it's an assault on all of our humanity and our human tendency to be connected with one another. 
and um, we have the opportunity to learn how to respond to this differently with um, children and inspire them to, uh, and, and to know that we are safeguarding their humanity um, and that we're not going to turn a blind eye to the traumatic things that are, that are happening. Um, so that, that's one thought. Um, also, I just want to echo what I think is the importance of having explicit um, protocols related to any positive COVID-19 testing that come about. And if we can find opportunities um, or have protocols in place for COVID testing for um, staff or families, I think that that would be reassuring to to many people, including myself. Um, I would be curious to see the metric for reopening explicitly laid out. Um, we talked about matching um, student uh, preferences to our staffing preferences. Um, we've talked about monitoring local cases and um, state of Illinois cases. I think you know, to know explicitly what measurements we're utilizing would be helpful. Um, I really appreciated the emphasis on social emotional learning, both for children and adults. Um, I appreciate how our values are showing up in this planning. And I think that it captures a focus on whole wellness. Um, I am also particularly interested in how there's thought being put into the social and emotional experience of children who are transitioning, transitioning to preschool, transitioning to kindergarten, transitioning students who, for whom this is their last year with us and they'll be transitioning to the high school. How are we, or transitioning into middle school, into sixth grade, how are we paying attention to the social emotional experience um, of those children and families, um, especially for our younger students because their learning is social and emotional. Um, their learning is oftentimes social and that is their job. Um, and they, in order to be safe, we are having to put barriers in place to that. So how do we support them in being able to do the developmental work that they really need to do um, at this time? I, I'm curious to hear how we're focusing on that. Um, and then, you know, we have invested time and energy into monitoring progress through MAP and also monitoring um, gap and opportunity to achieve via MAP. And there was mention of how we're going to make sure that folks are attaining at least a year or more of um, learning and how unfinished learning will be tended to. And I, I heard the focus on using rubrics and I really appreciate the focus on racial equity analysis and teacher collaboration and understanding that that's critical for educators um, to have those opportunities. But I'm also curious, how will we monitor that or compare our new measurements to our old measurements to um, tell a narrative of how we're, how we're progressing. Um, and I say all that also understanding and appreciating um, my colleague's emphasis on us being flexible and agile and thinking transformatively about um, what school looks like. Uh, so if y'all really wanted to take a or take the time to respond to any of that. I'm comfortable, but also we're we're over um, significantly at this point. So I'm also fine with um, getting those responses later um, in a way that is available to the public as well. Yeah, I think just before before we close, I think that um, you know to honor the over 500 people that joined us today and. Um, you know, I, I really do like SUNY's idea of um, having a town hall or some sort of opportunity for people um, to just, you know, to, to be heard um, and be able to share information. And, you know, there's a lot of things that families are doing right now. 
that are working for them. Um, and just again, how we can foster community and so that the conversation doesn't just stop. You know, there's the, you know, the, the Zoom meetings that we're accustomed to, um, but in between their life, life exists. And so just, I think to, to honor the 25 page um, comments that came from our teachers and from our parents, um, it would be nice to know that there's going to be some follow up of, of some sort um, to all those, um, those comments and questions. Yes, uh, thanks for that, Rebecca. Um, that's, that's exactly what I, I was mentioning earlier that we're going to have a series of those town hall meetings. Uh, we're going to start with our staff and then also we'll do some for the community of Evanston as well as the parts of Skokie um, that I've, I've had a conversation with their mayor uh, so we can have a similar uh, process. So that is, that is in the works. We're going to put that together sooner than later. Uh, so thanks for that. The other thing I was going to say, um, I would love for us to take the time. A lot of the questions and statements that were asked, many of these, many of these ideas and some of the, some of the responses we, we, have, uh, we, have, we have targeted some solutions for, but I think having it collectively, um, you know, so we can respond to the, the board as well as the community will probably be better time spent uh, if we can put them all together in, in, in a spot where we don't have to, you know, we're getting ready to go over time, we have to retreat and all of those things. So if that's okay, we would um, definitely spend some time over the next couple of days getting those responses together. Yeah, I think the questions from today and also even from the task force, um, there could be, if there's somewhere on the website where people can access the plan, but also just the FAQ uh, that has the list of big questions, little questions, that would be awesome. And it's something that can be rolling and updated as uh, new things come in. And also our principals will be hosting um, sessions too with their, with their staff and their parents. Uh, as well. Okay. Thank you all so much. Um, I appreciate the work that you all have put into it and um, I appreciate my board colleagues, your time, energy, and um, authentic um, commitment to our our district and um, being thoughtful for all of our our families in this process. I appreciate what you all have brought to this conversation. Um, and thank you to our community for, for tuning in and being in touch with us and sharing your needs um, as well as the uh, your priorities so that we can be uh, responsive to, to you all. Um, I, unless there are any other questions or comments, I um, will adjourn this meeting at 10.17. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.